Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Keith Silva. Nowadays, every, it seems everyone has a podcast. These often free audio programs can be streamed from a computer or downloaded to a smartphone and listened to on demand. With more than 5 million podcasts and 80 million episodes all total, there is something for everyone. Today, we're shining our spotlight on a podcast called Choosing to Farm. It's produced by a former UVM Extension colleague, Jen Colby, and when she's not herding sheep around her farm in Randolph, Howling Wolf Farm, uh, or hosting visitors at her yurt on the property, Colby talks with farmers from all over the country about why and how they choose to farm. Yes. Jen, welcome. It's always good to see you. Thanks, Keith. Um, thank thanks for taking time out of your schedule to, uh, to talk about talking to farmers. Um, I was trying to come up with a clever way to ask you about um, how you became a podcaster, if you went to podcaster school, or what your, you know, how, how well you did in your degree in podcasting, but what is the origin story of choosing to farm? So I, I left uh, UVM Extension a little over two years ago, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do moving forward, and the things that I wanted to um, uh, keep from my old life into whatever my new life was, and I thought about one of my favorite things to do has been to talk with farmers and ranchers mm -hmm. and to hear their stories and um, and I love the technical side. I absolutely love grazing and 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 ecology and all of the technical pieces, um, but it's the human stories that have always drawn me and um, and recognizing that I'm a returning generation farmer, mm -hmm. skipped a couple of generations in my family, and uh, increasingly through my job and as a farmer, I've met more and more people across the country who are first generation, mm. or folks who left the farm and have come back. Mm. Um, and those are really compelling human stories, and I think that there are a lot of people who will be inspired by them and have been, which is very humbling and ha wonderful. Having listened to the podcast, a subscriber, yeah. uh, they, they, are very <laughs> they are very humbling uh, and also inspiring, so kudos, it worked. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. Um, so as a farmer, you're used to doing just about everything on the farm. How does that work when you air, when you're running a podcast? Are you booking guests, editing? What do you have to do it all? Uh, in the in the beginning, I definitely have did it all, and I am still very capable of doing it all. Mm -hmm. I actually have um, an, an online a virtual assistant um, who works overseas, who isn't excellent editor and she's helping me keep track of lots of things um, but I am absolutely the person who is reaching out um, booking people I'm finding the guests meeting people I go to conferences and I meet people <laughs> uh, a lot of this is relational based mm. and so I'm doing the relationship work and she's helping me with some of the technology and social media support and that kind of thing okay so okay it doesn't have to be a one-stop <laughs> one <laughs> person it shop. doesn't have to be a one it person can be, shop. But it doesn't have to be um, one of the hallmarks of podcasting, as we, you were just saying, is this sort of do-it-yourself approach. Um, is there more to it than that, or is it just grit, determination, and internet access? <laughs> I think it's really important to do a podcast about something that you absolutely love, because most podcasts don't make money for some yeah. significant amount of time, um, or maybe forever, so it needs to be something that you really love and you're willing to do even if it takes a lot of time or even if, and there are a lot of different models around sure. the kinds of podcasts. So ours is just a conversational podcast. It's quite simple to do. Uh, there's not a huge amount of editing and um, there are absolutely folks who have highly edited podcasts um, and that's a whole different right. ball of wax. Right. Yeah. Um, before we hear an excerpt from Choosing to Farm, why, you sort of talked about it already, but why did you want to talk with first time and returning generation li livestock farmers specifically, yes. why them? So, so I've had a long career with live, livestock farmers in particular mm -hmm. and, um, and I, I know that livestock farmers are an important part of the solution to our future. Both we need healthy, happy uh, livestock farmers to manage the land well and profitable ones too, to manage the land well and, and to address climate change, to address flooding, um, to, to keep our biodiversity up. These are folks who manage large amounts of land mm. um, and we need more of them and we have fewer of them over, we've had fewer of them over time and they're not always coming from multi-generational farms or ranches. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those kids are going to the city. Mm. So, um, so we have more young and second career people, they're not always young, who right. want to get into this. 
and how can we inspire them? How can we help set them up for success before they start? Mm. Um, by learning from these stories about how people would do things differently and also what they like. Mm. Yeah. Talking about farming and choosing to farm, I thought it would be appropriate to hear from a farmer, in this case, Carly Farmer. She operates Wild Ginger Farm in East Fairfield, Vermont. Here she is talking about a tough day on the farm. It was our very first lambing season and it was midnight. We had a, a sick lamb in the house with us by the wood stove and we were giving it our all we gave it. We had IV fluids going, we had everything. And I just remember standing by the back door crying. You don't realize how much you, you, you actually care and love for these animals um, until you're in those situations where you're like, wow, I, I, I need to save this animal, right? So. Those are my hardest days, um, that one specifically, but farming comes with loss, you know, just natural loss or sickness or whatever you're dealing with. And those are always my, my deep down ones <laughs> where I'm like, yeah, you kind of, you keep those with you and you learn from them. Why did you want to talk to Carly for the podcast? One of the things that I should point out is this is a very personal story that she tells about uh, you know, loss on the farm, as she says. Yeah. Um, this is sort of what podcasts, conversational podcasts, you were saying, they're all about these sort of intimate moments yeah. of people sharing very personal stories. Um, so th that sort of answers my question of why did you want to talk to Carly, <laughs> but why did you want to talk to her in general? It wasn't all doom and, and dead uh, lambs. Right, right. <laughs> no, no. I, and I do think those are those are compelling stories, yes. real stories that right. that uh, don't make it onto Instagram necessarily. Don't yes. make it into social media. Sure. Um, we paint a really bright picture, mm -hmm. and we don't always talk about the reality. Right. And I think that's important for anyone who wants to get into this business to understand the reality. And I was following her on social media, and I was seeing her, um, you know, describe uh, trying to trying to get this farm established, trying to do it while balancing life with a partner and a baby and being exhausted and trying to get all the things done. I just thought she, what I thought was there might be a compelling story <laughs> and then it was wonderful, yeah. There's a story there as we say in television. Absolutely. Um, talking about farming and choosing to farm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, working with Across the Fence, I should say, I've got to meet lots of amazing people and one of them is Brent Beidler. I think anyone who's met Brent would say the same thing. Yes. He ranks near the top of my list. I've been using video that I shot at Brent's farm of cows grazing more times than I can count. Um, what's interesting about you featuring Brent on the podcast was that he has chosen not to yes. farm anymore. So yes. why focus on someone who's chosen not to farm? One, I, I, I've, I've known him for many, many years sure. as a neighbor and a friend, and, um, and, he's, and he's been very thoughtful the whole way, and I, I he was thoughtful in the choice not to farm mm -hmm. in the same way that he was thoughtful in the choice to farm because he was a first gener well returning generation person as well. Um, and I think it's really important that folks who are in farming and folks who are considering getting into farming uh, recognize that it does not have to be our entire lives. We mm -hmm. can do things for a period of time and then in a very healthy way set ourselves up for choices later on, and that's not been the culture of agriculture. Yes. Um, it is It is very traditionally, I will die milking <laughs> the cows in the, in the yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the tie stall. And um, and I think that, that Brent's story of how his farm enriched his life, he was able to do amazing things, and now he's in a new chapter in his life very intentionally. That's something that I hope we all look up to and aspire to as farmers. We choose what we're gonna do next. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the cliches about returning generation farmers is that they're dreamers and risk takers and getting into a lifestyle that is, uh, favors tried and true over uncertainty and chance. Which brings us to Becky Harhai. Uh, let's hear an excerpt from her interview on the podcast, Choosing to Farm. I will give up what I've done for the last 15 plus years. I'll give up the career that I've built and start something completely new that I know nothing about. And I don't have parents that were born and raised on a farm. I myself was not. I grew up in a suburb and I lived half a block away from a grocery store my whole life. Um, so for me to think about 
moving out into the middle of nowhere, like wh wh where do people buy stuff? How do you do things? It was like moving to another planet. Jen, what is typical about Har High's story as a first generation farmer? Oh gosh, uh, having to learn everything from scratch, I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, because we can read and we can watch YouTube videos and, and, there's, <laughs> and there's so much preparation that can happen right. online, but um, really getting like feet and hands and boots and like in the soil with the animals, um, they don't necessarily teach you in a YouTube video how to manage animals that die or something right. that you know, you're trying to move. Like Later in the podcast, life stuff. right, life stuff. Life Later stuff. in the podcast, you she talks about I didn't know where to buy a goat. Right, you know, going to the there's no goat store. Goat store. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, there's a goat store, but it's not really a goat store. Exactly. <laughs> um, so what's exactly. unique about her experience? So she's from Minnesota, correct? She's from Minnesota. Okay, yep. so different part of the country. Yep. Um, what's what what is unique about her experience? Oh gosh, so the, the I felt it, it was really unique that she came directly from a completely uh, a completely different industry um, and basically just threw herself out there you know some of the mm. other folks that I have talked to uh, they've done like little bits of transition along the way maybe mm -hmm. they've started super small or they've they've uh, worked on farms and she and her husband and family, like they didn't work on farms. They just said, no, we're doing this. Right. And then maybe we'll meet some neighbors and maybe it will, you know, we'll find goats. <laughs> yeah, of course we'll find goats someplace. Okay. And so just uh, the rebel side, I think that she's, you can clearly tell that she's a rebel. She just decided and she jumped. She jumped. Yep. Uh, all in, as they say. All in. Choosing to farm is free to download or stream. Uh, but if this is going to develop from a sideline to something more, you need to expand and get sponsors. And I know you're working on that. Yes. How can people uh, get the podcast? Oh, awesome. So if they go to choosingtofarm.com, they can actually sign up to be on an email list and they will get episodes delivered in their inbox. Excellent. Or uh, any pod catcher, podcast yes. of choice. iTunes, you're, Spotify. You're on them all. All the major ones, yep. All the major ones. Yep. Excellent. Um, I want to thank everyone here at WCAX who's working behind the scenes to make Across the Fence possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.